Welcome to the Ice Warm webinar series and especially to this, our first webinar for 2018. I can't wait to hear from Shu King and Siva, two professors from the University of Wollongong who know quite a lot about coastal water storage. In fact, the water industry is known for its innovation but needs to keep adopting innovative solutions as the world continues to urbanise. It's great to see so many joining and quite amazingly from over 23 countries around the world. Uh, my name's Trevor Piller and I'll be chairing today's webinar helped by my colleague Joel Vorpin um, and we really encourage you to get, uh, join in the discussion of questions. You can see from, from a map there on the screen now that there's quite a spread of uh, people from the US to across Australia and New Zealand and everything, everything in between. Just a, a screen there of uh, the enormous amount of webinars coming up in the next few months. Uh, I'll go into those more deeply uh, later on, but uh, that's the webinars we have coming up in the courses, uh, of course, as well. Um, so we'll leave that for now, but um, come back to it. Uh, so today we're going to have um, presentations by Dr. Uh, Shu King and Dr. Siva, first Dr. Siva, uh, and then Shu King, and then after that 15, 20 minute presentation, we'll have 20, 25 minutes of Q&A open to everybody. So today's presenters, Associate Professor Shu King Yang uh, in, in the University of Wollongong, Director of Coastal Reservoir Research Centre at the University of Wollongong, also a founder of the International Association for Coastal Reservoir Research. And that uh, association does have a, um, a workshop coming up soon, which we'll talk about later in the, um, in the webinar. Also, first up, of course, is Professor Siva, who is at the University of Wollongong, a close co colleague of Shu King Yang's. His uh, area of expertise includes water quality and water resources engineering, pollutant export from urban catchments, which I would have to say is probably one of the uh, key issues of today's um, uh, discussion. Right now, I'm going to hand over to you, Professor Siva, uh, to kick us off. And it's such a delight to welcome you both. Thank you, gentlemen. Oh, thank you very much, Trevor, for, for that nice introduction. Uh, we are very delighted to, both Xu Qing and myself are very delighted to be uh, giving this uh, webinar to, to all of you, different parts of the world. Uh, um, and uh, again, an acknowledgement right from the outset for IceWarm for making this uh, opportunity to happen. Great pleasure. So our um, uh, seminar, actually, the, the, I'm sure that most of you would have seen the, uh, the title. I'll just make sure that... Um, uh, you are able to see all the screens. Uh, it's, uh, the, the title of our seminar is Water Shortage to Water Storage, an Innovative Solution. Now, uh, we also have a, a workshop, international workshop fairly soon, uh, uh, where we are going to discuss more about its uh, feasibility from different parts of the world, uh, and more information can be obtained at that website address. So uh, both Xu Jing and myself are from the Center for Coastal Reservoir Research, which is a, a newly established research center at the University of Wollongong here in Australia. Uh, so for this seminar, uh, I just give some brief outline. Uh, essentially, in the introduction, I basically want to introduce the, the UN Sustainable Development Goal, uh, particularly six. Um, and we'll move on to some aspects of inland uh, dams uh, for water storage. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, we'll try and t talk about various water supply options. Currently we have, I'm sure that most of you are from various water authorities, uh, I suppose uh, you're aware of it. And then we'll try to justify the, the importance of a coastal reservoir uh, and on what's happening around the world, including the research uh, we are conducting at the University of Wollongong and followed by conclusion. So I will sort of introduce the stage and then when the coastal reservoir uh, section comes, it would be taken over by uh, Professor Yang. So, uh, the, so the UN uh, uh, Sustainable Development Goals, there were 17 of them. Uh, I'm sure most of you should be aware that it was uh, uh, agreed by the United Nations in September 2015. Uh, these uh, 17 goals are very much interlinked, uh, although uh, goal number six particularly focus on uh, clean water and sanitation. And we are aware that uh, a significant number of people, about 2 billion people globally, are living in countries with uh, excess uh, uh, water stress uh, and of course water scarcity also affects uh, a significant population uh, uh, of the global population. So in the past of course uh, we have constructed uh, inland dams uh, and many dams uh, have been constructed. You can see this diagram which uh, from the 1900s onwards uh, we had a peak in the 16, uh, 1960s and 70s or 80s and most of them are coming of their Mid, uh, mid life, I go, or you can call it the mid uh, uh, life crisis, I guess. So, so there are issues with uh, uh, inland dams uh, uh, in terms of finding locations and capacities. 
if you look at uh, and also they do undergo depends on the source waters and uh, geological conditions and various others it does undergo sedimentation um, so if you look at the australian context uh, of course all of us most of us really live uh, along the coast and that reflects the, uh, the these locations you can see that uh, these uh, uh, locations are all along mostly in the east coast and of course tasmania uh, do have a number of dams uh, but these are all essentially uh, uh, inland dams uh, and and since we do live along the coast there's an ample opportunity to put coastal reservoirs now this slide essentially uh, the, the top one gives you the uh, again the total number of dams as you say that in the australian context it has uh, uh, it's reduced uh, as well as the uh, water supply dam for water supply also has uh, been reduced uh, and then as as population grows uh, in the next uh, the, the bottom of the slide it shows that uh, our cumulative storage is lower uh, the population grows so when you look at uh, the per capita storage available, uh, of course, it's going to start steadily decreasing as far as dam water storage goes. Uh, of course, this prediction going into uh, 2150, I wouldn't worry too much about uh, uh, past about 50 years, but uh, so this is just a prediction uh, from, um, from just uh, sim simply looking at uh, population growth data. Uh, now, if you also look at uh, uh, the Australian capital cities is what, what was the last dam which has been uh, uh, built uh, in different uh, capital cities you can see that they are all uh, you know between 24 to uh, 40 years of age again you know coming into uh, sort of early midlife uh, of their uh, design uh, capacities and if you look at their water storage of course we have had uh, very low storage volumes also this of course depends on climate change and climate variability so there is uh, obviously a need to have alternative water supply sources uh, as you know that uh, there are existing water supply solutions and uh, um, available uh, water conservation and uh, uh, water restriction if it's the worst case uh, uh, a small amount of water uh, rainwater harvesting is being done wastewater recycling uh, and of course, uh, most capital cities uh, uh, do, ha uh, almost all, all capital cities we do have now in Australian context, seawater desalination as a supplementary water supply. So the key question is that, are these existing water supply solutions working? And I'm going to pass it on to Professor Yang to, to show that we have a much more innovative way to get some substantial uh, water, source, uh, water storage. Professor, uh, okay. Thank you, Professor Silakuma. Uh, good afternoon, most of you. <coughs> Thank you very much. And now I try to uh, share with you my observations about this uh, uh, com uh, this, uh, this question, big questions. Remember, 10 years ago, eight years ago, from 2000 to 2008, 2010, Australia and Shanghai had the same problem, big drought, we don't have enough water. And Australia use these strategies. <clears throat> and Shanghai use a different strategy, cost reserves. Now eight years already, eight years already, and then it is a good time for us to go back. How about the solution? And then by compare different strategies, and then you guys can get your conclusion. In future, what kind of strategy we should use? Big question is our population is increasing. <clears throat> Look at the population increase in urban and the city. To this year, 2050, we will have another city, city one and city two. Even as Siva just said, in the dry year 20 to 20, uh, uh, 2010, this period, and we don't have enough water for city. And now, 30 years later to this year, we will have another big city. For these people, they don't have any time to drink. So how to solve? That means this is a good question for our next generation, for your kids, for your grandchildren. You have to think about it. And then this problem has been realized by many people. Say, Dan Hart, what is your headache? Historic headache for Australia, worldwide also. And then you can say, how many years later, 2028, 20, we don't have enough water to drink. Big question. 
for us. <coughs> so when we, people talk about the shelter of water, what kind of assumption they make? They say, this is a picture from China, and then same as Australia. They say big flood, this hydrograph. Big flood, water, we can't use it. This is not water resources, just lost to the ocean. And then for the environment flow, we cannot touch. This is also, and for human being, we can only use this small water. <clears throat> and then based on this one, they said we are short of water. This is why we say we are short of water. <clears throat> So they just simply assume a big flood of water can develop. There's big questions. Now we have a challenge in this one. And also they try to assume dams can only be built only in the upstream freshwater environment, not a seawater environment. We also want to stand up, say no to this one. This is a hydrograph. Uh, this is a water cycle. This is a huge desalination plant designed, managed by our God. And then our human being just assume we can build a dam above the sea level. Now, we are going to build another dam in the sea. And then to develop huge amount of water, lost to the sea immediately. And if we can develop one to five percent of the water loss to the sea, enough for us to quench water water crisis. So our faith is different from other groups. Our faith is there is sufficient water available in the world for man's need. And then <clears throat> before it, we already have some cost reservoirs. We just build a tank here and use the river course to store the water. And then we have problems. What kind of problem we have? We what quality? No good. And then also bigger environment impact. And also the quantity no good, not very nice. In the future, we are going to build a second generation cross rivers. We will use the sea space to store our water. And only in the flood season, we open the gate and then divert, uh, divert the water, high quality water to the space to the resource. Most of the time, year long, the nine months, 10 months, 11 months, 12 months, maybe only one or two months open this one, and then most of the time, we will keep the, uh, this part open. So fish can go up, and the flow, sediment, the nutrients can go downstream. We have no influence to our, to our environment, ecosystems, fish production is MD. So look at the Australia's <coughs> data. Now we say, how much water we have? We have so much. How much water we use every year? So little. Compared to here to here, 4.5% of, of normal we use that. So our conclusion is that Australia is not running out of water. Water is not running out of Australia. Same for other countries. So we give the definition. What is cost reservoirs? We say cost reservoirs is fresh water, inside the seawater, very simple. Based on the location, time size, and the purpose, we have different uh, purpose. Here, I, can, I have to highlight here, we have some cost reservoirs for drinking water. We only develop the high, best quality water, and the next quality water for education, and the worst quality water, fresh water for industry. And the very, very poor, the worst quality water, we also can store in our cost reservoirs and then treat it after meet our government standard and then we discharge it to the ocean. We can protect our ecosystem, our marine life. We want to protect our, improve our water uh, our, our, our coastal environment. <coughs> now, if you look at the worldwide now, many, many places we call us dead zones. For example, Shanghai and other places. And then we need to use cost reservoir to improve our environment, not damage our environment. So in future, your generation, your, your, net, your kids' generation, your grandson's generation, they will say reservoir will have two types, one in the inundation of the land, another one in the inundation of the sea space. And then one is uh, in that reservoir, another cost reservoir, one above the sea level, another one under the sea level. <coughs> So call for cost resource design, the inland dance, many limited sources. 
non renewable. But for cost reservoirs, renewable and unlimited, you can put cost reservoir any place. And for them, high price, high risk. And then for cost reservoir, no risk. And then the wave force is wave surges, and when it is the fast to stop. And then it separates a density. But a big problem for cost reservoir is that it is water quality, pollutant. For inland reservoir, we only have damp based reservoir, uh, pollutant. But cost reservoir, we have both land based, land -based and sea water. That's the biggest challenge for us. If we can solve this one problem, and then we can solve all the problems. <laughs> Now in the world, we have many cost reservoirs, and then this is the east. <clears throat> and we are very proud of to say, Australia is the pioneer in the cost reservoir construction. This one in the Murray River Mouth. <coughs> and now this is the uh, Singapore cost reservoirs. If you want to see cost reservoirs impact and social impact, and then you go to Singapore to see. And then you try to interview the, all the people's scenario here, and then to get your conclusion where the cost reservoir had negative, positive social impact on it. And next, Hong Kong one is the first drinking water cost reservoir for cities drinking water purpose. If you want to see it is the environmental impact, negative, positive, and then you, because this one already 70 years already, you can go and see and then talk to local people. And then you can see how many uh, fish productivities have been affected or negative or positive. You can ask them, and then we are proud to say we ask our students to do the PhD, uh, do the thesis, spend many one year to in, to do the investigation. We can find the negative impact. <coughs> this one, and then they have the negative social impact, but this is not by cost reason because they want to do this nine reclamation for huge area, and then they this one has this problems. Uh, this one has problems for what quality. And then we can solve this problem. This is the Australia's water quality problems. And then cost, first cost reservoir. Because it is the first generation cost reservoir design concept and biologists here. And then we have the water quality sonality problems in the uh, minimum drop. And now we can solve this problem also. <coughs> Shanghai. Shanghai recently, I just said at the beginning, you compare the different solutions. At the same time, 2000 to 2010, Shanghai and uh, our Australia we use different strategy. Shanghai used the cost reservoir. They had a cost reservoir here. This is the sea here, cost reservoir here. <coughs> now everybody drink water for there. Everybody helps. And then there's the cost reservoir. So now we look at this one it's because of this huge demand, and now we know next generation we drink water for, from cost reservoir. So are you? University of Wollongong set up this research center. We have the experts from water, energy, geotechnical structure, many places. We have 20 academic, full time academic staff. Also, we, together with other uh, different countries, India, China, and the uh, Netherlands, UK, and uh, Mauritius, and uh, we set up this international association. Now, few months only. Russia government set up this uh, chapter, Indian chapter, and then this time we will have this Australia, New Zealand chapter also. And then very soon we have other chapters in different countries. We will have this first uh, type of this uh, cost reservoir research uh, uh, conference. And then we are concluding, we'll talk about the SG, SBG6. We provide a solution for this one. And then because we say, we have enough water, different from other particular solution. And we have 10 keynote speakers, a past president of IHR, largest hydronic research association, water resource association, and hydrology association, we join us. And the decision makers from Shanghai, and Mauritius, and the state government, and the Australian water ministry, also we join together to have this water leaders from them. We work on you if you try to challenge this strategy and you have good 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 idea or or, or negative comment, right? Uh, comment. We really, really work on you to discuss this this expert. Okay, finally I'd like to get my conclusion. <clears throat> Fresh water is one of the largest 
natural resources available in the sea. <clears throat> this is very important. And our conclusion, the sea water desalination for most of the places in the world is unnecessary. Very key information. <clears throat> coastal regions are very dominant in the future water supply, as more and more people will migrate to the coast, like Australia. <clears throat> Use the innovative technology, cost is about what quality could be managed and depending on the intended use of the water. And then cost reservoirs can be used, uh, can supply sufficient high quality and affordable water to the world with very important one, keywords, minimum environment and social impact. And then I welcome your comments for our center because we have to identify our research Yes, in everyone. Thank you very much, everybody. That's excellent, gentlemen. Thank you so much for your effort here. A, a vast amount of data and, um, and, and research into just 15, 20 minutes. Thanks so much for your uh, time on that. Now we're going to get into the, to the, some of the issues that we're, we're uh, uh, talking about here uh, that uh, Siva and uh, Shu King have been talking about. So if you want to come on screen, and once again, as I say, raise hand, hit, hit the button for raise hand. And uh, if you want to say a couple of questions, they're coming in now, uh, hit the Q&A button. That will be excellent. Uh, just mentioning the coastal reservoir research um, uh, workshop coming up, because we won't answer every question here, as you can understand, but um, we'll send this uh, link out to everyone um, after the webinar. Uh, you can see that uh, on the screen there right now. Um, I think what we might do is um, shoot straight into some of these questions that are from the um, City West Water Group. Um, I understand they're um, uh, meeting with us. Uh, uh, Ian Monk, uh, Monks has been um, uh, part of this webinar and along with his team there. So look, there, there's three questions here, gentlemen, uh, but I'll start off with the first one. As a company that doesn't own tracts of coastal land, how would we influence the creation of reservoirs? So City West Water is a uh, water uh, business in Australia, uh, in Victoria, uh, and they're asking, as a company that doesn't own tracts, large amounts of coastal land, how would we influence the creation of reservoirs? Uh, Trevor, I will go and uh, answer the, the, this question. Um, yeah, uh, basically, of course, most companies would, be, would not be owning tracts of land, uh, I suppose, coastal land or, or yet alone uh, coast. Uh, so this is a very, very, very good question, actually. I would say this is a very good question. Of course, it depends on uh, uh, the location and the, which part of the world uh, we are talking about the, course, uh, the creation of the coastal reservoirs. Uh, I suppose in the Australian context, it does uh, come back to a whole range of uh, uh, government departments, state, federal, local, um, uh, and the marine uh, you know, law and things like that. So this is one of the reasons that in our research center, we have a a law expert, Professor Gregory Rose, uh, who is there uh, with us, and he's going to give a presentation on uh, what are the key aspects that we need to be looking at in terms of uh, creation of a reservoir in, in a coastal or near coastal environment. That's great. The, the second one that they're asking, isn't the water naturally too salty for use in normal ways as reservoir water? Isn't the water right. I, I think the, the, this... Uh, Again, uh, every question is a good question, uh, Trevor. <laughs> uh, I, I suppose in this uh, case, uh, maybe that uh, perhaps the concept is not well understood. So we are actually capturing the fresh water in the sea environment. So initially there'll be some aspects of uh, dewatering and removing the sea, but eventually once uh, all the mixing process are taking place, we are actually storing only clean water and unso uh, you know uh, so it would be there won't be any salty water they, there's potentially some salt water intrusion underneath but essentially uh, we are talking about storing fresh water yep yep and there's a ton of questions coming in so i'll keep moving and thanks for keeping your your answers reasonably short and uh, once again for the detail it's going to be that workshop that really counts uh, martin albrecht from the world bank in usa has asked a couple of uh, really uh, insightful questions i wonder about the magnitude of the financing needs for such reservoirs when you compare it to alternative water sources like groundwater extraction? Uh, Shuching, you won't, I, I'm happy to answer this as well. Uh, look, uh, the, in terms of uh, financing needs, of course, it's again, it depends on the specific location and so on. Not every place is where there's going to have uh, groundwater extraction to start with. So, so we really need to look at uh, uh, what are the uh, locations where this is? I mean, uh, so if at all, uh, cost benefit analysis indicate that groundwater extraction is the best way to go, perhaps mm. that, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, but there are numerous instances where we think that uh, coastal reserve concept could be considered. 
The second part of that, again, Martin, goes on financing needs under normal circumstances as well as under more difficult circumstances, such as with high levels of pollution, land subsidence in coastal areas, urban flood situations. Uh, and I'm basically thinking of the situation in Jakarta, Indonesia here. Uh, yes, I, I think that's definitely a, a, a special case. I can see that uh, uh, that uh, uh, in any coastal reservoirs, uh, when it comes to catchment management, I think obviously it's, uh, th there is a fair amount of learning to be done in terms of uh, people understanding the same way that we manage our upstream catchment in a land-based reservoir. We really need to look at uh, uh, the location uh, and once chosen the location, and of course the, the whole catchment really need to be managed uh, to the best of our ability. Yep, yep, that, that's great. Thank you, Martin, for those those questions. That's good. Dr. Saeed Hamid in Pakistan. Uh, great to have you with us today again, Saeed. Um, thanks for your interesting presentation, says Saeed. I'd like to know the cost benefits. And he goes on to say, so cost benefits, he goes on to say that in countries like Pakistan, where almost 90% of sewage is dumped in the sea, along with industrial pollution, uh, pollution I don't think it's feasible. What is your take on this? Uh, okay, I, I, maybe I can answer, Sivan. Yeah, okay? yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, for the f uh, previous questions, uh, and uh, you, you talk about the cost reservoirs, cost or, or, or something, and then you just look at the Shanghai. Shanghai's water supply is similar to it is uh, original tap water uh, price, so much cheaper than this machine. And for if you have the sewage and then we encourage them, never discharge your sewage to our cost reservoir, to our to the ocean. You can you can you can do this one, <clears throat> and then you can separate this one, and then to make your we only take this high quality flood water. in that period, you can you can manage your 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 one, and then give us the best quality water. But if you don't have the the flood water, and then if you don't have the river water, that's another story. Yep, yep. So uh, Chaturam in India, Jaipur, which type of which type of reservoir is best as a permanent as a as permanent environmental point of view uh, uh, regarding as environment? Yeah. environment mm. point of view, Sorry, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right, okay. Actually, our cost reservoir try to protect our environment. Yeah. Cost environment. Because in the world we have many dead zones in the coast and no fish, you know, anything and then we want to treat the most quality water and then after meet our demand and then we discharge it to the ocean. We can yeah. also choose this one. Yep. So yeah, I have comment also, Siva, on that environmental, because I know it's going to come up yeah, again look, repeatedly. Look, uh, I think that's again a very relevant question in, when you come to coastal reservoirs. I, I think my view on this one is that we are talking about a very major uh, infrastructure project. We are talking about substantial uh, volume of water storage for you know such an important uh, resource, natural resource, which everyone depends on. So, uh, any major project, whether it's in land, whether in the sea, it will have some environmental aspect. So, it is uh, how to minimize that and how to look at uh, in terms of selecting on the location, uh, distance away from. Uh, populated centers and so on. So it's really, it's a matter of uh, choosing it. So we cannot say that absolutely there's no environmental or social effects, but it is how best, the based on the benefit, uh, because this is going to have uh, benefit to everyone. Uh, so that uh, that type of thing will come. I mean, we are we are researchers and uh, engineers and scientists. We are going to come out with solutions with all the, uh, but there, there'll be some uh, uh, political and social uh, uh, dialogue uh, has to happen actually when when it comes to actual implementation. It does seem more and more that th this this is more about um, uh, horses for courses, as uh, is often said in, in an English phrase. That that where 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 it suits, we use it. Where it doesn't suit, we don't use it. There's a question here from Jock Richardson. Uh, how do you deal? And it's more the scientific issue. How do you deal with seawater intrusion in into groundwater below the reservoir? So you get this. Uh, yes, yeah, I, I do understand. Shooting, would you like to answer that? Yeah, you answer that. This is right, typical. Yeah. Yeah, that is right. Look, uh, you, you know, the, uh, the, in a co in a normal reservoir, we have a, a water on one side, and we have a, a concrete or different types of dams which is holding on. There is a, a fair amount of pressure. Whereas in a coastal reservoir, we are going to have clean water on one side and sea water on the other side. So of course, there is a dynamic balance. Uh, which will uh, will keep those depends on the different uh, levels, I guess. So, uh, so we need to know the geological conditions of the the site and uh, 
it is possible to design uh, the, the way it has been done in uh, Shinkauza uh, and, and other places where it is possible to keep that uh, uh, seawater seepage to the very minimum. So that, that, that sort of uh, determination and modeling has been done and we can show that uh, we can maintain freshwater environment within coastal reservoir. Yep, yep. Um, Huda Almaroff has asked, what about the coastal ecosystem? We're back to that environmental issue. Uh, will it be shifted or redesigned? Or will, will it be redesigned? The coastal ecosystem. Well, well I, I think, uh, you know, the, uh, in uh, Xu Ching's uh, slides, he has mentioned about the second generation coastal reservoir where we are keeping the, the river uh, mouth essentially open for most uh, of the time, except for the period where we want to extract water during uh, high, high flood events. Uh, so to answer question, the, one of the previous question and, and this one now that the, one of the previous question is that if you have so, too much uh, uh, sewage or raw water, raw waste going on, but in a in a significant flood event that would be significantly diluted. So there will be there will be some. So we can monitor these and then we can really look at uh, at what point uh, you know the gate opening and closing can be done. So that's one uh, answer for that. The, the second one is about the environment. Clearly, if you generate a coastal reservoir. Uh, that environment become a freshwater environment. Yes, I think that that, that is that's what happened. Uh, so yes, we are creating a, a freshwater environment, but it's uh, compared to the near shore significant. Uh, uh, you know, for example, in Australia, we have forty four thousand kilometers uh, kilometer of coastlines and, and an associated uh, environment. So so this is going to be a, a fairly smaller uh, part. Uh, yes, it would become uh, that area is likely become the freshwater environment. That's great. Greg Mashire has also asked, how, how is the issue of siltation in coastal reservoirs addressed? Switching about sediment transport, you want to say <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Different uh, the sedimentation, uh, you must not uh, say that the inland dams, for example, uh, Sydney, uh, uh, Wanangam Dam, and uh, every inland dam had the same problem. Eventually, every inland dam was going to die without a dot. Same for coastal reservoirs. The difference is, in and then the dam, the, the dam dead, and then you cannot build another dam at the same location or nearby. But cost is very different. Once this one is fully sealed, and then you can build the cost reservoir in the sea near your, your cost reservoir. And then your existing cost reservoir, the sealed, can be used for land development, like the land reclamation you can use for to generate another city. So this is a benefit. We've got one here from Suresh. Um, if we are capturing the water during significant flood events, apparently this will be the time when there'll be the largest amount of sediments. How long is the re reservoir going to last? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, but thank you for that question uh, from, from Suresh. Uh, yeah. Melbourne Water. Mm. Melbourne Water, right, okay. Yeah. Yes, uh, but uh, you know, the when we are capturing, uh, depends on how the whole design is that sometimes we probably will be capturing mostly uh, suspended sediments rather than the bottom sediments. So compared to a normal flood event where uh, the water is going to be sort of carrying a range of sediment concentration across the water column, I think we will be primarily capturing suspended sediments. And th that would really depends on uh, uh, the sediment dynamics of the uh, given river system. So that, that can be assessed and uh, we need to uh, yeah, make that assessment. That, that would be part of a feasibility study. Um, there's, there's some uh, interesting questions coming up here. We've still got uh, a few minutes, quite a few minutes left, and there's quite a few people staying on board with us, so let's keep this going. Um, can you comment, Malit uh, in Queensland, Malit in Queensland, Malit Shah has asked, can you comment on the relative unit cost of stored water inland storage versus coastal reservoir storage? It is, a, it is a right to the financial core yes. of the issue. <laughs> you did some calculation before, maybe you can answer that. <laughs> Are you there, mm -hmm. shooting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What, what's your question, sorry? Uh, it's about the, um, the relative unit cost comparing inland storage with coastal reservoir storage. Can you comment on the relative unit cost between these two different types of storage? For, for, the, for the cost, unfortunately, I, I cannot give you very details because of this one short time. And then in our, in our workshop, we invited the Shanghai people come to here and yep. then one cost reservoir. Uh, yesterday called as designer how much it, because I, I look at the data in, in, the, in the website, he said, no, too much. And I only spend $1 billion dollars Less than our destination plan in, in Sydney. And then supplied 24 million people in my Shanghai. Equivalent to whole 
country's population in Australia, only one million dollars for whole for whole countries in Australia, similar to this one. You can you can compare it by yourself. But you but you think there will be a better uh, dealing with this uh, at the actual workshop itself? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. They, they can in the next day ask the designer, planner, and uh, all the people come to here, and then you can ask them. Then let me. Yep, yep. <laughs> yeah. now, I'm just taking that top one. Um, now, while there is clear drinking water supply constraints in some of the overseas examples, for, for example, Singapore, whether there should be unconstrained access to discretionary water, outdoor water usage for garden water in urban areas, and hence whether water supply systems should be designed for such unconstrained access is a philosophical political question. Very happy we, to take that question Trevor, I, I <laughs> as a have comment. Said by text and say I yes. So. <laughs> yes, thank you for that. Done. We'll, we'll take that as a, as a comment and yeah, agree. Yeah, that's a comment. Um, yes. uh, Martin in the US uh, said again, is there any experience with the stability and safety of dam structure in permanent seawater contact? This would be especially important, important with the reservoir is not only a storage for freshwater source, but also serves as retention basin for flood water or dam against flooding from seawater, storm surges, etc. So that is about dam structure permanency. Yes. Okay. Yeah, please go ahead, Shujing. Yeah, can yeah, I yeah. If you compare to the dam, especially California, the earthquake area, and then you can imagine you have the dam above your, your head, and then people live in the coast. What happened if I had the, 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 the earthquake? That very, very high risk. But if some, the same earthquake happened for the coast reservoir in California, and what happened? If our, we had a break, dam break, we have no anybody will be die, will, will die. This is a big difference for, and for the <coughs> structures, uh, dam structures, now for coast reservoirs in Shanghai, they use the, they call as geo tube. Maybe most of them don't know this, uh, this one. They just make a plastic bag and then put the sign inside, and then that is done. They very cheap. But, so this is why I, I encourage all of you come to here to, to listen to the experts who build the country as well. And then you can learn this experience to different countries. Hmm. Uh, perhaps if I may add uh, to Xu Jing's comment, uh, Martin, that uh, uh, you know your question is uh, very relevant, but we do have coastal reservoirs, the one which Xu Jing has already outlined that it is in uh, Xinkaosha, which is the Shanghai Coastal Reservoir, which is now in operation for probably about 10 years, I guess. But we do have uh, from Plover Cove in uh, Hong Kong. Uh, of course, we talked about uh, Marina Barrage in uh, Singapore. Uh, there's also in uh, Korea. So uh, so they are in the last uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, we, we do have examples of uh, coastal reservoirs surviving. Uh, and, and of course, uh, there are stability studies done on those. So, so, the, so there, there, there are some uh, body of information available. That sounds great. Sean Berry in New Zealand uh, with Soil and Water Consultants. Is there a potential for coastal reservoirs to be used as a tool for combating existing saline intrusion problems? It is an interesting question. It's a wonderful like question, it. actually. Yes, yes, indeed, actually, because once you create that uh, freshwater environment adjacent to some of the uh, groundwater system, more close to the land will become more uh, fresh water rather than seawater. So seawater gets pushed. So so it does, uh, so that's definitely a, a yes, I would say yes. Yep, yep. Uh, Ian Monks from, I'm oh, sorry, uh, Shu King. Yeah, if you look at this, uh, this uh, uh, River mouth development. Yeah, Ian, Ian, Ian Monks uh, has yeah. asked that question. I'll just yeah. read it out so everybody can see it. Uh, uh, from City West Water, in Australia, many rivers already have lifestyle towns around pristine river mouths. That's a really good comment. This must limit the opportunities to create coastal reservoirs near urban demand areas. How do, how do you overcome this problem? Okay, look, look at the Shanghai, big city in the, in the world, yep. and then they have no problem. Look at the, every city, they have the port, yep. near, the, near the, 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 the river mouths, and they have no problem. Our one's quite similar to environment, mm -hmm. empire, and the size, quite similar to our port. Mm -hmm. Look at the Sydney airport, the whole airport in the, inside the sea. Our coastal reservoir is similar to this one, but environment in Paris is much, much less than yep. uh, Sydney's uh, airport. Wait, that, it, it's, it's, there's a million questions coming on. That, 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 these are just pushing the, um, the, the issues. I don't know where to, so, where to so go next. Perhaps yeah, you, I may add that in, in some cases where uh, if it is not right in the city, we may have to go the same way, for example, in Sydney. Uh, water, we go right across the whole range of uh, uh, reservoirs for you know hundreds of kilometers away. I guess we do have uh, uh, yeah. transport water from uh, large yeah. distances. So that's yeah. an option. Yeah, 
That sounds that, that sounds an interesting the development. Can coastal reservoirs? Greg Mol Molica has asked: Can coastal reservoirs be combined with pumped hydro? This is interesting. Combined with pumped hydro to store solar power and generate electricity and reduce the overall cost of the scheme. Exactly. Actually, now we're, we're do, doing the design cost reservoir for India, and then we exactly use this concept. And our Australia uh, Energy Minister already said in uh, South Australia, uh, Adelaide, we should have this uh, uh, cost reservoir for energy storage. You, during the night time, they pump the water yep. to the cost with a higher level, and then in the in the tomorrow morning, and then we open the gate and then remove the water to the dumpster. Uh, another cost is about to generate the hydropower. Yes, many many yep. opportunities. Yep. Yes, yep. I, I think that aspect really I, I would consider that as a third generation where the water and energy nexus comes in, and then yep. how to design these. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yep. Um, Greg Mashire has asked, in terms of life cycle financial environmental costs, some of the supply from majority of dams is by gravity, as highlighted earlier in the slide, while 100% of the supply from coastal reservoir will need to be pumped. So this is logic. How does the carbon footprint of a coastal dam, particularly pumping, compare with other supply options? Although we have not calculated this, but uh, remember, uh, we were just ha having this discussion about water energy nexus. So the coastal reservoirs are lending itself to have uh, uh, wind and solar, uh, you know, renewable energy options where, yes, it, it would be 100% pumped, but we need to look at the source of energy where it comes from. So we need to really look at uh, uh, how to incorporate renewable energy into the coastal reservoir development. Also, I'd like to highlight this one to you, compare coastal reservoir with desalination. Desalination also need to pump the water from the sea to your treatment plant and then pump to your user. Same. Yeah. But we don't want to pump back to the ocean. Yep, yep. I, I, I want to ask the next question because the questioner, uh, Shepo, is from Botswana, who knows what time it would be there, Shepo. I, I, you probably, uh, thank you for joining us. It's fantastic. What is the typical uh, rate of return on this investment and what's the global market capitalization? It's a big question, but it goes to the issue of how, how much uptake. <laughs> we are the research and now unfortunately we don't know the investment and the finances. <laughs> but I, I suppose the International Association for Coastal Reserve Research is trying to, to yeah. capture yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, Absolutely, I understand for sure. There's, there's, uh, there's a, a longer uh, question at the top there. Professor Yang claimed in his conclusions that coastal reservoirs will have minimal environmental impacts. Yeah. What liaison has Coastal Reservoir Group undertaken with the other disciplines, marine biology and coastal processes, to make such claims. Yeah, uh, yeah. so that, that's really the, the yeah. gist of the question. It goes a bit longer than that, but um, I just wanted to raise that. Okay, uh, well, this year we have the undergraduate student thesis. We should also see one and myself supervised this, this, uh, this student because we already have course reservoir from uh, Netherlands, from Australia for 70 to 80 years already. We have the cost reservoir in Hong Kong for 60 years already. We asked them to find the significant environmental impact. After one year's investigation, no, we can't find it. We do appreciate if anyone who can find a significant environmental uh, impact, let us know because this yep. is our opportunity for research. We really need this opportunity. Okay, yeah, thank that, you. That's a good open, good open approach to the, the science as it develops and the innovations that are there. I, I think we might leave it there, gentlemen, and everybody that's joined us. Thanks so much for staying on board for so long. Um, there's been a lot more we can uh, look at here. Well, a lot more than we can look at here in one hour. But um, uh, thank you so much for your time on this. And uh, we really appreciate your uh, energy and effort toward this. And, uh, and um, wish you well for the workshop coming up. Um, we will now be sending out to everybody um, this recording and um, I just remind you there on that screen there you can see the um, the upcoming webinars six seven there coming up they, are, they look to be a, a wonderful array of um, innovative um, ideas in the water industry um, so with that um, I think we can sign off and say once again thanks for joining us everybody from all over the world it's been a terrific um, uh, discussion uh, and thank you, uh, Shu King and uh, Professor Siva, Professor Shu King from University of Wollongong. We really appreciate your time. Thanks, everybody. Thank bye you. for now. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.